I'm going to put the video mm. spread together. Boker Tov and good morning. Welcome to today's Torah study. Today is uh, Tuesday and it's uh, June 29th when we are uh, learning Tanya today. Today's Tanya is uh, generously sponsored by Howard and Susan Weisberg in loving memory of Howard's parents, Milton and Sarah Weisberg. May their souls be elevated in Gan Eden in, in, in heaven in the merits of the beautiful Torah wisdom that we're about to study here this morning. And today we're, we're going to be learning uh, the second half of chapter 49 as well as chapter 50. We'll be covering two kinds of love in our relationship with Hashem, the master of the universe, with our Father in heaven, with Hashem. Right? Again, we've, we've spoken about this idea many times, how it's really, it's really vital in order to have a relationship with something, to have an emotion associated with it. You know, you don't have, just have an awareness relationship with a parent or a spouse. You have an emotional relationship with a parent or a spouse or a child. So too with your God, with your source, with your life source, with your Father in Heaven, it is vital to have a, an emotional connection in order to really con be considered alive. Otherwise, you're, you're, you have this prof professorial relationship which is really not uh, anything uh, to write home about. So, what we spoke about in the first half of chapter 49 was the conclusions of recipro reciprocal love. Just to, to summarize the idea in brief, we spoke about how, how um, God's infinite light and God is almighty, right? So God is almighty. How does almighty create a world that is finite, that is limited? For that, we, Hashem has to go through the process of tzimtzum, which is self-contraction, contraction of self. It's a voluntary process where God literally limits His life, like a lampshade. If you put a hundred lampshades over a, over a lamp, it's going to become much, much, much dimmer to the point you probably wouldn't even know that there's a light there. And so too, Hashem hides Himself, contracts His light both quantitatively and qualitatively in order to be able to dim the light to the point that it would be, it would be, uh, it, it would be enough that it wouldn't blow us to smithereens. It wouldn't be all, so almighty, so unlimited, that we would still be able to live a life of definition and finitude. Generally speaking, we mentioned that these are the three worlds of Yetzirah, Bria, Yetzira, and Asiya, the worlds of creation, formation, and action, which is what the, Kabbalistically we know there are four worlds. Atzillus, the first one, is the one which is still contained within godliness. But the next three worlds are, are the outside of those of that original world, the world of creation, formation, and action. We here are in the lowest level of the world of, crea of action. And the final product of all of these uh, limitations, of all of these diminishments and symptom, is our physical world which allows for material lusts. Our material world which allows for a state of ego, which allows for a state of, of mind where we can live in a way where we can actually openly rebel against the Almighty Master of the Universe. Can you imagine being in the, inside of the White House, inside of the Oval Office, inside of the President's, in, in the President's presence, right? Can you imagine being right there and ignoring the President's presence? It's difficult for us to conceive, right? But imagine if the President were, and obviously, you know, it's just a metaphor, we're not comparing the President to the, to the Master of the Universe, but just in terms of a, of, a, of a sense of awe in the presence of something which is important or maybe more important. Imagine if the President was to contract and hide himself to the point that you wouldn't even notice that he's there. If you wouldn't notice that he's there, you might, you might feel free to say things that you wouldn't normally say or do things that you wouldn't normally do. Right? So too, that's exactly what happens when Hashem hides himself and limits himself and contracts himself through this process of symptom to the point that we can actually feel that we're alone in this world and that there is no God or we can have a debate and discussion about is there a God, is there not a God, what about the Holocaust, what about this person, what about Surfside, how could this happen? We can have this discussion, right, without realizing that the elephant in the room is that, is that God is right here, is just hiding himself because if not that God was right here, nothing could possibly be. There is no such thing as, as self-creating self anything. Right? Anything which, which created itself is part of Hashem. That is the definition of the master of the universe. Not that God created himself, but that God is, always was and always will be. V'hu haya, v'hu hove, v'hu He was, he is, and he will be. In fact, the name of God 
the name of God which expresses his infinity is the Yud and the He and the Vav and the He. We say it as Havaya because we're not allowed to pronounce that name. That name is made up of, of past, present, and future because God is timeless. Anything which is timeless is the expression of Hashem. Now, when we reflect on this idea, when we reflect about how much Hashem has done for, for us, how much He has contracted Himself in order to create us and to relate to us, all because He wants to create us, because He wants to have a relationship with us, we suddenly are filled with a sense of OMG. Wow! He did all that for me? We reciprocate by saying, wow, if God did all of that for me, then I want to do something for Him too. If He did all that because He loves me so much, then I want to love Him too. And like He limits Himself for me, we're inspired to limit ourselves for Him, to set aside all our desires and our cravings and our yearnings and our personal uh, preferences to say, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And just like Hashem goes completely out of His comfort zone for us to the point that He's literally out of the picture, at least in our perception, we're inspired to do the same for Him. Now this leads us to a very, very beautiful meditation, which I'd like you to consider incorporating into your daily davening. I see that our, our YouTube is very, very low here. I'm hoping we're not having any issues. Let's see what's going on in Facebook. Good morning to you, Rob Berger, Marty Knopf, Terry Zweig. Wow, that's Chicago, New York, and Atlanta. And Winston, Shalom Alecha from uh, Indonesia. Harvey in Chicago, Marty also. Corey in Gardens. Howard and Susan were the sponsors of today's Torah study. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Rabbi. I'm curious to know, Winston, is our YouTube working? Because I see there's only one viewer there. Um, I'm wondering why that is. I know that Ashley fixed something there last night, but i um, curious to know what the issues are on YouTube. But in any event, um, back to Tanya here. So here's the meditation, folks, which I'd love to know YouTube, and don't worry, I'll upload it later ASAP. Thank you, Winston. I appreciate you doing that. There's something weird going on on our YouTube. I know we're meeting a little later today, and we'll chat about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Winston. Um, I, I noticed, actually, that you uploaded our YouTube class yesterday after the class, and by the time I saw it, there was already 15 views on it, which is interesting, so it means that people are watching it, you know, not live, but later. So thank you for that. Uh, Joe G says she can't catch us on YouTube. I don't know what's going on over there, but anyways, you, uh, Winston will fix it. Thank you very much. So back to the Shema, because I'd love to, to have you incorporate this meditation into your daily davening. As Rob Berger, the chairman of our daily davening, of our daily minion, our chairman in exile, <laughs> he's, he's holding the reins from Chicago, right? <laughs> Rob, you'd be proud to know we had a big minion here this morning. Um, so as Rob calls the deep davening, I'd like you to, to encourage you to take your davening to the next level as follows. By incorporating this particular meditational process through your davening, starting from Baruch Hu, which is the beginning of, you know, before Shema, there's two blessings before Shema. One starts right after Baruch Hu, after Yishtabach. That's the first blessing of... Um, of the Shema, and then the second one starts, Ahavas Olam, Avtanu, you have loved us in eternal love. So let's take a look at this just to quickly recap this and, and move on. So, so it goes like this. When we say the blessing of the Shema, the first blessing seems to have little connection to the Shema. I guess the second blessing also has little connection to the Shema because the first one speaks of God's greatness. It speaks about how even the angels are in awe of God Almighty, how they can't even reach Him, how they, even they say He is He's beyond us, He is beyond us, He is beyond us, and that's the meaning of the word Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. He is beyond us, we can't reach Him, even the highest angels say that. Now the, the second blessing of the Shema talks about His great love for us, and how Hashem yearns to connect with us specifically. So what is this going to do with the, with the Shema? I mean the Shema is a, is, is a declaration of God's unity, and then we say you have to love Hashem. So, so what's the connection between how, how, high, how much higher he is than the angels in the first blessing and how much he yearns for a relationship with us in the second blessing? But here's the explanation that Tanya gives us, which is so beautiful. Not complicated, it's just need, something that you need to remember. So here it is. In the first blessing, we realize how incredibly infinite God is. That even the angels that are so, so, so far beyond us, Hashem is so far beyond them. So throughout the, the, blessings of the, the first blessing of the Shema, you realize, Hashem is infinite. In fact, He creates. He's the creator of the universe. Not only is He the creator of the universe, we realize that the universe wouldn't exist for one single second if not that God was creating it continually. And that's the doctrine of perpetual creation. That if God was to, wanted to destroy the world, God forbid, He'd literally have to do nothing more than just stop. If He would just stop creating it over and over and over and over and over again, it would cease to exist because nothing can exist without... The energy of Hashem. So that's the first blessing of the Shema. 
And by the way, we mentioned that no once but, no once but twice in the first blessing of the Shema. This idea of Hamachadesh Betuva Bechol Yim Tamid Masabreshis, how Hashem renews every single day in His kindness the acts of creation. So there we learn about the infinity of God, and then we come crashing down to ground zero in the second blessing of the Shema, before the Shema, where we talk about that despite His infinite greatness, where is the apple of His eye? Yours truly. Wow. Now that's, that's like a double take moment. That's like, really? All that He wants is a relationship with me? That, that's really what God wants? I mean, He could do anything. He could have dinner with the Queen of England, and He could, you know, He could hang out with the loftiest of angels. I, me? Seriously? And that is where we realize, it's like, how can He have a relationship with me? And we, if He's infinite, we say, okay, here comes the doctrine of Tzimtzum. Tzimtzum contraction, it means that He contracted Himself with a little tiny bite-sized relationship worthy piece. Because I can't, I can't drink from a water fountain. From, no, I can't drink from a fire hydrant, I'm sorry. I can't drink from a fire hydrant, never mind from an infinitely powerful pressure of water, right? So how can I relate to God which is infinite? It's got to be because God limited himself, contracted himself into a tiny, tiny, tiny little nothing which I can relate to and that's what a Torah and mitzvah is. A mitzvah means that God contracted himself into a tiny little box of tefillin or a mezuzah or a Torah wisdom that we're learning right now. And by learning Torah, remember, we've learned this in Tanya, that God and His wisdom are one and the same. Hashem and His wisdom are one. So when we learn a piece of wisdom of God, we are now connected with God Himself, essence. And we've learned in Tanya chapter 5 that Hashem, if in the place of His greatness, that's where you find his, his humility. Where when you realize that God has contracted Himself into the, the vast... Um, you know, we get, we get overwhelmed by how much Torah there is. But when you realize that in what overwhelms us is where Hashem has limited Himself, so that you take a little tiny piece of Torah, a little tiny, a little tiny law. You learn this week's Parsha, the portion of Pinchas. Or you learn a law. A law that when you wake up in the morning, you've got to wash your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six with a cup, which has got to be, you know, uh, a certain size. When you, when, when you learn a little basic law like that, you're connecting with God's wisdom and God and His wisdom are one. So God has contracted Himself into something which we can relate to. Now, when you realize that, you now enter the Shema. First blessing, how great He is. Second blessing, how nevertheless, we are the apple of His eye. Now you come into the Shema, you say, oh, you shall love God, you God. Absolutely, now I feel a reciprocity, a reciprocal love that I certainly and very, very much want to relate to, to develop a reciprocal love to God when we contemplate these two ideas. And that's, guys, by the way, the reason why we cover our eyes. When you go like this, the reason you cover your eyes with the Shema is because you're not supposed to be looking at your cell phone. You're not supposed to be looking at the guy next to you or who's at the front door or, or if we're missing a roof tile here in the shul. You're not supposed to be looking at anything. You're supposed to be thinking about this idea. And when you say that, and you, and you then verbally affirm, and you shall love God, and Levavecha with but with all your hearts or with both of your hearts. What does both of your hearts mean? We've learned earlier in Tanya that we have two hearts. We have a we have a godly soul and an animal soul. Each one of those souls is made up of intellect and emotion, a full set of intellect and emotion. You know, I was telling my kids the other day, the octopus has three hearts. You know that. Octopus has three hearts. Human beings have one physical heart, but we have two emotional, uh, emotional sets, two sets of emotions. One is the godly soul, one is the animal soul, right? And when we, when we go through this particular meditation, not only is our godly soul inspired, I mean, it doesn't take much to inspire our godly soul to love God, but even our animal soul is impressed. Right? No matter who you are or how arrogant you are, if somebody went out of his way to save your life, what, what happens? You're forever indebted to that person. So when you realize that God has literally bent over backwards and, and jumped through hoops and contracted himself into a tiny little, little chew box in order to be able to relate to me, even your animal soul is impressed and begins to develop an emotional relationship with God. And that's why it says, you should love God your God with all your hearts, with all your soul, because you say, if Hashem did so much for me, then I would give Him everything. And with all your very, now with all your very, what does that mean, very, V-E-R-Y? There's different opinions. Some say with all your 
possessions or all your money. Others say that it's all your energy. Whichever way you want to interpret it, the bottom line is, is that when you realize that Hashem didn't leave a stone unturned in order to allow for me to exist in this beautiful life that He gave me, and I owe everything to Hashem, it's at that point when you go through this meditation through to the end, that you realize I'm willing to do everything absolutely for Hashem as well, to give Him absolutely everything. Okay, um, let's take a look at this idea inside of the words of the Tanya. I'm on page 635 in the practical Tanya. If you'd like to follow along with me just to see this idea in the gorgeous words of the Alter Rebbe. Middle of page 635. If you don't have the book, then don't worry. Just follow along with me. Having demonstrated the theme of God's love for you in the blessings before the Shema, the Tanya now discusses the corresponding feelings of love for God, which you will experience when taking these words to heart. And this is the final answer to that question. How are these blessings a preparation for saying the Shema? See, here goes. Now, when any intelligent person will impress these words upon the depths of his heart and mind, then instinctively, as water reflects the face like a mirror, his soul will be ignited. Then he will be infused with a generous spirit to willingly disregard and relinquish everything that is his. God pushed aside his infinite lights as to have a relationship with you. He disregarded the sweet songs of millions of angels and chose to focus instead on your worship. He even chose your body to be a sacred temple dedicated to his worship. When you ponder these thoughts, your heart, your heart will want to mirror all that love God back to God. And you will want to be devoted only to connect to God and to be absorbed in his light of attachment and fervor with intensity of kissing and merging of spirit with spirit as mentioned above in chapter 46. What did we say in chapter 46? We said that when you, do, when you did that, when you, reach, when, when you realize how much you love God, you want to kiss God. And what's kissing God? It's serving God with your mouth, with Torah. Specifically, as, uh, as Malki from uh, Cleveland asked, um, it's, it's, uh, it's through studying Torah law, halacha, the code of Jewish law, because that's the clear-cut and concise sh uh, um, um, conclusions of Torah. So when you study halacha, which is Jewish law specifically, which is what we do on Thursdays, Thursday mornings, then that is effectively a kiss to God Almighty. And we said that, the, uh, the, that you want to give him a hug, and a hug is the, is the mitzvahs that you do with your action. Tefillin, kosher, Shabbos, Shabbos candles, tzitzis, whatever mitzvahs you do with your actions, and then thinking, thought, speech, and action. Thinking would be thinking Torah. Um, and now he explains this idea. From the above discussion, you get the impression that all God requires from you is to have a feeling of love for him. A desire to escape your existence and return your soul to him. This, of course, is not true. Judaism requires worship through actions in this world and not to escape from it. And now this is how it works. But since Judaism demands worldly activity, how is this merging of spirit and spirit achieved? Practically speaking, this is what I just said. I'm just going to do it in the words of the Tanya. To explain this, to explain this the next verse of the Shema states, And these words of Torah shall be upon your heart and you shall speak of them. The third verse of the Shema teaches us that devotional attachment to God, merging spirit with spirit, is achieved practically speaking through Torah study. An emotional longing for God alone won't connect you with Him. It's like being emotionally in love with your wife or your, or your husband. If you're emotionally in love, it's fantastic. But unless you show that emotion, it's not going to go anywhere. It's nice that you feel the love, but if you don't express your emotion, your spouse is not going to be aware of it. And that's obviously... Not a good thing, right? An emotional, uh, for how could a finite being such as yourself bridge, bridge the chasm that's, that separates you from an infinite God? However, within the Torah, God has placed His very self. So that when you take the Torah upon your heart and understand it deeply, you merge spirit with spirit and kiss God, so to speak. As we learned above in chapter 5, the mind-to-mind -mind connection that God, with God that takes place through Torah study is a phenomenal merging experience there is no other merging experience like it nothing quote quoting tanya chapter 5 nothing remotely comparable exists in the physical world where you become completely one with another entity from every conceivable perspective so there's no ability to be as one as bonded as united as intimate as one with another thing as a human being becoming one with god through the study of torah because when you study torah your brain 
and the wisdom are inseparably united. Think about it. Even in a marriage, you've got two people coming together as one. It says, therefore shall a man leave his wife, leave his parents, leave his, his mother, and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. But when they become one flesh, I mean, they do become one flesh through the, through the child. I mean, that's a pretty strong union. But even a greater union than that is the union created when you study Torah. When you study Torah um, and your wisdom becomes, your brain becomes one with the wisdom of Hashem. Now, um, that, was, that was just the metaphor of kissing, right? Still, the metaphor of kissing implies a raw connection of spirit, not a cognitive one. How could the Tanya equate kissing God with a connection of the mind? Therefore, for it's stated in a Tzchayim, the union with God described as kissing is primarily a union of the mental faculties of Chochmah bin Adas, which in our case, these words upon your heart refers to the cognitive analysis of Torah. Now, and kisses of the mouth allude specifically to the study of legal conclusions, halacha, since the mouth expresses and it discloses the de deliberations of the mind overtly. So just like what, what comes out of your mouth is the, is the conclusions of what you've been thinking about. It's like the bottom line. What comes out of your mouth is the bottom line. If I was to tell you everything I'm thinking right now, it would probably be gibberish, right? It, it would be into unintelligible. The fact that I'm, I'm hopefully being rational, <laughs> hopefully being understood, is because I've thought this through, and I'm, and I'm delivering to you only the bottom line through my mouth. So too, when we want to connect to God through a kiss, it's the bottom line of Torah, which is, okay, so beyond all the deliberations of the Talmud, what is the bottom line? Do you make a blessing like this? Like I was, learning, I was studying this morning about rice. The Talmud gets into a whole discussion about rice and millet. What blessing do you make on rice and millet? There's a whole discussion. Do you make a shahakul near bedvaro a blessing? Because it... Um, um, th 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 which would be similar to something that does not grow in the ground, or is it a uh, bore minimizona's blessing, which is a blessing that is that is um, uh, like an, on uh, grains, or is it a blessing of bore priyadama, something which grows on the ground? The Alter Rebbe concludes that somebody who's God fearing should make all three blessings, or eat it during a meal after you wash tamotzi, when you don't need to make any other blessing. So that's that's a conclusion of Torah law, right? And when you clarify that Torah law, that it would be considered the kisses of the mouth. Your mouth expresses the final conclusions of your mental deliberations, and that's why the comprehension of Allah of law in particular is described as kisses of the mouth of God because it is the conclusion of a Torah discussion analysis. So the metaphor of a kiss with God highlights the nature of speech to bring thoughts to their conclusion, which is specifically when halachic words of Torah are studied, since the word of God is halacha. Our conclusion then is that the most intimate connection with God of kissing and merging spirit with spirit is through study of halacha with the mind. So when you study the halacha, the law in your mind, that's, that's merging of spirit. And then, you, exp uh, um, then you, you express the study with your mouth. That would be the kiss. So it's a, th a thought and a kiss. It is only with the mind that you have a phenomenal merging experience when you become one from every conceivable perspective. And it's only through the study of the halacha, of the law, that you connect with God's life-giving mouth, so to speak. In conclusion... This love, we, we're working our way through the Shema over here, right? That when you go through the meditation of the first and second blessings before the Shema, God's infinity, and then nevertheless how we are the apple of His eye, that inspires us to love God. But when you love God, in the second verse of the Shema, Havta, that leads you to the third verse of the Shema, which is, V'shinantam levanecha v'dibarta ba'am, and you shall speak, and you shall... Study them with your children and you shall speak of them. I'm just pulling up the Shema. Just to make sure I got everything in the right uh, verse order here. So, V'shinantam Levanecha is the logical sequence. Sorry, V'hayu Advarim Eila. I'm sorry, I, I skipped to the fourth verse. V'hayu Advarim Eila, Asher Anichim, and Savchayim Alavavecha. And these words which I'm commanding you today shall be upon your heart. Why is that the third verse of the Shema? Because the logical, the next step after love, it's not after just love. You got to kiss and hug if you love someone. So, how do you do that? How do you do that to God? Through the study of Torah. That's exactly what the third verse is. And then comes the fourth verse, other verses, which deal with Torah study and mitzvahs because they are vital in enabling a relationship of true closeness with God as we've discussed at length in Tanya. Right? We've learned that Torah study is God's essence. Remember, we learned the first word of the Ten Commandments is Anochi. It's actually an Egyptian word. I am God, you are God. The word I is an Egyptian word, Anochi. Why? Because it's actually an acronym for four words. I know, nafshi, ksavis, yehavis. I have infused my essence into my writings. 
because God has infused his essence into his writings. If you want to embrace God, you have to do that through Torah study. It's not enough to say, I'm a Jew in my heart. Go tell your spouse, I love you in my heart, but I'm not going to do anything for you. When, you, when your wife asks you to take out the garbage or, or to fill up the gas in the car, and you say, I'll fill up the gas in my heart. Or I love you in my heart, but not with my hands. That's not going to go very well. I don't think she's going to take that very, very well. My, my, my humble opinion, right? You've got you to show your love with your actions and your, your hands and your feet, right? So, so Torah study is God's essence. A mitzvah, the very word mitzvah means connection, means intimacy. That's why we say, Asher kiddushanu b'mitzvotav, who has married us with his mitzvahs, because a mitzvah doesn't just mean a commandment. It actually means a connection. So every time you do a mitzvah, you're literally marrying God Almighty in a way that would not normally have been possible. Right? And now what we do is, we explain that spiritual connection, Torah knowledge is not enough on its own. We need physical mitzvahs in order to impact this physical world. This is an idea that we learned earlier in, chapter, in chapters 36 and 37. That we weren't placed in this world, and this is the conclusion of the chapter, I think I'm going to conclude with this idea, that we weren't placed into this physical world only in order for us to have a relationship with God. Because we already haven't had a relationship with God before we were born into this world when we were literally beneath the heavenly throne, which is the origin of souls. We already were in a place, out of a beautiful place of connecting to God. Yes, in this world we can connect to God more on a deeper level. Fair enough. We can overcome challenges in order to be able to prove that love. That's fine. But we weren't placed into this world only to have a relationship with God in a dysfunctional place. Like there's no purpose in sending your spouse far away just so that you can have a long distance relationship. Like what's the purpose of that? If you had a, sh a short distance relationship, then what would be the purpose of, of, of just having a long distance relationship for the sake of having a long, long distance relationship? God put us on this earth on a mission. What is that mission? Like we learned in Tanya 36 and 37, we learned that it is in order, in order to be able to sanctify and sublimate this physical world and also our, our animal soul. Because every time we do a mitzvah, a physical mitzvah, we are working with a physical object. We're using physical food that gave us the energy to do this mitzvah. We're sanctifying a piece of geography of this world. We're using our animal soul which participates in the action and all of the above are becoming sanctified and sublimated. So if you find yourself in an airport in Darfur, well, hopefully not. In maybe Kazakhstan, if you find yourself on a beach in the middle of nowhere, I want you to think to yourself, I wonder if anybody in the history of the world has ever studied Torah on this beach. Think about that a moment, right? I wonder if anybody in the history of the universe has ever studied Torah on this beach. And then at that moment, maybe you could think about this Tanya, or, or say Shema Yisrael, or say a Torah verse or something, or pull out your phone if there's Wi-Fi reception, and, and, and read a... Uh, a piece of the portion of the Torah or something or Tehillim. Because then what's going to happen is that you will have brought not just Torah study to your own soul, but brought Torah study to that locale. You will have sanctified that spot, that animal, your animal soul. And, and, and when, especially when you do a mitzvah, take your tefillin with you. When you're after tefillin on that beach or in that middle of nowhere place, then you're doing a mitzvah in that particular location. And that's why it's not just enough when you feel this reciprocal love. It's not enough to just say, I feel the love and I'm going to express it through thought and speech, through Torah study alone. You've got to express it through action. And that action is, um, is achieved through mitzvahs. Right? So you need both Torah and mitzvahs. Torah in order to connect your soul. Mitzvahs in order to connect the physical world. Let's check if there's any questions coming in here. I see Marty, um, true to his style, Marty always has felt that Never liked the interpretation of Bechol Me'odecha, loving God with all your wealth, with all your money. Never liked that one. You always went for the other side, which is all your resources, all your... No, no, actually, actually no, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I am mistaken. I am mistaken. I thought that you meant to say all your energy, but it seems like you're, you're flipping now because all your resources would include your possessions, right? So I am sorry. I was making a mistake. You have actually um, 
evolved because I think that last time we learned this you were you, you interpreted it as or you preferred the interpretation of all your energy but now you're saying all your resources I think you're you're starting to shift a little bit which is good it's very very good I'm glad to hear that um, obviously why would you use all your resources why would you do that right this is everything exactly like you just said so I stand corrected I do apologize and you are correct and um, this is everything you write because why would we give everything for Hashem for what reason this is not a fundraising uh, scheme here. What this is, why we, we would give everything for Hashem is because, again, we're trying to sanctify every single thing in this universe. And where we are is where we have been sent on a mission. If you've never been to Siberia, it's probably because your soul has nothing to do in Siberia. If you've never been to New Zealand, it's probably because your soul's got nothing to do there. But if you're in Palm Beach Gardens... Probably because your soul has something to do in Palm Beach Gardens. And when you sell your home in Chicago and you move full-time down to Palm Beach, that's probably because your soul understands that you've finished your mission up there. And now you're ready to, f to focus all your energies on Palm Beach Gardens. Where you are is where you have been sent. Everything that happens to us is an emissary from above, a, a, a shaliach on a mission from above. I spoke about it in my sermon this past Shabbos. We have nothing to be afraid of if you're ever fearful that is an expression of idolatry because you believe that there's something else has power over you other than God. But to believe in Hashem Echad means to believe that everything, God, God is one, one, everything is a part of God, is to believe that God is everything and everywhere. And therefore I have nothing to be afraid of. Oh, Maureen is listening. I've got to be careful. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right, fair enough. Um, but uh, the realization that everything, that God is always in control and is everywhere and is everything, allows us to reach a state of equanimity where we're not afraid of anything. Anything that happens to us doesn't faze us because we know it's all a message, a message from Hashem, including the places that we go, the houses that we purchase, and the houses that we don't purchase, the businesses that we get involved in and the businesses that we don't get involved in. It's all a mission because your mission is to be able to sanctify this physical world. Let's just take a look at these, this last idea here on page 638 in the Tanya, just to take a little bit of a look at this. Nevertheless, I'm just going to do the bold face over here, middle of 638. Nevertheless, um, you, don't, you still don't fulfill your obligation of Torah study with thought and contemplation alone until the words of Torah are, are, are vocalized audibly. Why? Because when you vo vocalize them audibly, you pull the blessed infinite light down here, right down to your energized animal soul which rests in your blood. When you speak it, that's when your animal soul is involved. If you're just thinking, it's your godly soul. But if you're speaking it, you're involving your animal soul. And since the blood is sustained by nourishment from mineral, vegetable, and animal matter, food is sustaining your animal soul, then what happens? You thereby pull the infinite light of God of Torah, not only on your animal soul, but also on the food that sustains you. Over the page 639, the reason why we need to pronounce the words precisely to pull down the God's infinite line into all aspects of your physical being is in order to elevate it all to God. That's our mission, along with the rest of the world, to be absorbed in God's oneness and infinite light. And this elevation of the physical world will one day shine upon the earth and its inhabitants in a palpable way. That is the era of Mashiach. And the glory of God will be revealed and all flesh will see together that God is speaking. You see, the accumulation of, of, of thousands of years, of scores of Jewish generations, doing mitzvahs in different places and with different objects, are creating sleeper cells of light. We have light, we have God's infinite light that is dormant in millions and millions and billions and billions of objects around the world to the point that when Mashiach will come, that's when the light will go on and suddenly everything will start to glow. I don't know if you've ever been to Orlando, to the Animal Kingdom. There's a beautiful part of the Animal Kingdom Park. It's themed on the Avatar movie, um, Avatar, whatever. It's just an interesting theme. Where they, what they've done is, is that they created this place. You've got to go there at night because the, the rocks actually glow. It's a beautiful thing. The floor glows. The trees glow. Everything's glowing. It's kind of like the theme of the movie, I guess. So the idea here is, I thought it was a very, very beautiful idea because... When Mashiach will come, the rocks themselves, the trees themselves, the stones, the wood, the, the pebbles, the chain fence, everything's glowing because we have already through thousands of years of work, 3,333 years to be precise, since Moses brought the Torah down from Mount Sinai, we've infused the godliness into every single object and it's laying there dormant until when Mashiach comes. That's when our eyes will be opened, like it says, and the glory of God will be revealed and all flesh will see together that God is speaking. We'll see the word of God which has been revealed by us 
inside of every physical object. That's why we're having a long distance relationship, not for the sake of the long distance relationship, but because we're on a mission to do something in the distance. In this lowly physical world, we've been sent down to this world in order to make it a home for God. For this elevation of the physical world is the purpose for which the entire chain of worlds was created. What a moving and powerful idea. The whole of creation was why? The elevation of this physical world. So that the glory of God should fill all of this earth, in particular in a palpable way, a place which was previously hidden from God or hiding God's presence. Now we'll have it revealed through our actions with darkness transformed to light and bitterness to sweetness as mentioned above in chapters 36 and 37. And here comes the, the most powerful words for this is man's purpose. Friends, this is our purpose. We weren't put on this earth in order to pay our bills and buy another home or get a job and chase our tail in the rat race and make a little bit more money here or a little bit more money there and get this deal, that deal, or the other deal. That's not why we were placed upon this earth. There's more to life, friends. And this is the ultimate purpose of man and the goal of his worship. To draw down, to pull down the blessed infinite light down here into this lowly physical world. No one can do this for God except for you. Because every single one of us Jews has been allocated a portion of real estate from this earth. If you take the amount of Jewish souls that there are on this earth, in the history of the world, figure, figure it out, 3,333 years. Let's say we've had 100 generations since Moses times, I don't know, let's say 20 million in each generation. That's a big number, right? I don't know, let's say it's 200 trillion Jews that have ever lived, right? So you take the real estate on earth divided by 200 trillion pieces and every single Jew gets a little piece of real estate which is theirs. Now whether this is physical real estate or metaphysical real estate, it doesn't really make a difference. The fact of the matter is, in order for this world to be illuminated, every single Jew has to do their mission and that's why we have the, doc the, the idea of reincarnation. That when you, when you die from this world and your soul goes back up to heaven, sometimes it's sent back down. Why is it sent back down? Because you're not finished your mission. You might have just been unconscious through your whole lifetime, right? And that's possible. We know a lot of people that are unconscious, that are literally walking zombies. You know, they think they're awake, but really they're asleep. They're spiritually unconscious in their marriages, in their marriage to God, in their awareness of people around them. I mean, there's all sorts of levels of unconsciousness. And a soul will have to come back to this earth in order to fulfill a mission which it was assigned and if we are, are now at the generation where the Rebbe promised us the Mashiach is coming in our generation, what, what does that mean? It means that we're at the very, very, very end. There's tiny little nothing pieces of real estate left over. Let's finish the job, guys. Come on. We've got to pull our act together. Maybe it's this Tanya class that is, needs to inspire someone here. Maybe it's Winston in Indonesia. Maybe it's Howard and Susan in Boynton. Maybe it's me in Palm Beach Gardens. Who knows? We need to do one more mitzvah to be able to tip the scales. The world's an equally, equally balanced scale. To tip the scales, one feather will tip everything for the good, for ourselves and for the entire universe to be able to ultimately bring Mashiach because one more piece of real estate, and that's why it needs to be illuminated. And that's why we are so vital in the plan of God. He needs us because God made himself vulnerable to our choices. He limited himself. He says, it's going to be dark until you guys get your act together and you decide to invite me into your world. So we have a choice. Either we can say, God, you know what? Thanks for no thanks. I'm, 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 I'm having my lunch break right now. <laughs> lunch break until, I don't know, for the next hundred years, right? That's a problem because the whole world is waiting. I mean, literally, think of yourself in, a, in, a, in, a, in an Olympic arena. And in the stands, you've got King David, King Solomon, Bakhsheva, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Jacob, Adam and Eve. I mean, you've got the 12 tribes. You've got the Rabbi, uh, uh, the Maharal of Prague. You've got Esther, Mordechai, the Maccabees. I mean, you've got everybody. Moses, Aaron, everybody's up in the stands. And we're on the field. And they're like, we've done our part. We're just waiting for these guys. You know, it's like a, it's like a relay race. They're passing the baton, right? So they passed the baton for 3,333 years. And now, you know, you're waiting for the baton to be passed on to you, right? But imagine if the guy, the runner, he brings the baton and the guy, the next guy is like sleeping on the field. The whole history of the world is waiting and they're watching us. And what are you doing? You're taking a snooze. I mean, it's a little embarrassing. It's very embarrassing. Very embarrassing. 
So guys, Tanya opens our eyes to say, guys, this is the purpose of why we put in this earth. Do another mitzvah, study more Torah, illuminate your portion of the world, and Mashiach will be an automatic outcome of that. In order to bring God's light to this world, which is your purpose, you need to be luminous yourself by reading the Shema and its blessings intently. You will develop a desire to transcend the world and be intimate with God. Now that you are charged and energized, you can better fulfill your purpose of bringing God's light down here into this world. And that, folks, is a wrap on chapter 49. I did not get to chapter 50 today. I do apologize. So once and when you upload the video, please, to YouTube, please uh, make sure it's only end of chapter 49. We do not begin chapter 50. God willing, we'll do that one next week. But thank you very much, everybody, for joining me here this morning. It's always, always, always a pleasure to study with you. This really marks the end of the 40s, chapter 40s, the 40s of Tanya. Right now, chapter 50, 51, 52, and 53, well, really 51, 52, and 53, really, is its own little section in Tanya. Chapter 50 starts, is finished with the reciprocal love. We're starting now with a brand new kind of love in chapter 50, and that is a love which is different to all the loves that we've spoken about before. It's like the difference between gold and silver. It's going to be the difference between, it's a totally different quality of love, whereas the other loves have been what, loves like water. This is a love like fire. The other loves we've spoken about before have been loves that were motivating us to want to hug and kiss God. The next love in chapter 50 is going to be a love that will want us to be nothing. That will want us to just expire. What I think they call rapture, which means just to, just to lift off and get out of this world. We'll be talking about that love in chapter 50 next week, God willing. Anyways, everybody, thank you for joining me here today. Shalom. Have a wonderful day. And always, always, always a pleasure to study with you. Thank you. Don't forget, you can always send me an email. Rabbi at JewishGardens.com. We'd love to hear from you. Rabbi at JewishGardens.com. I am getting much better in my email response. So thank you. Take care.